idea is whenever we talk about experiments, there's something called the three big principles of experimental design. Um, these are kind of the philosophy of why we do experiments the way we do it. And the three principles are control, replication, and randomization. So I just want to quickly go through these um, in a little bit quickly, and then we'll kind of talk, and you'll see how they relate to a big experiment. So the first principle of experimental design is control. And this is different than a control group. What we mean by control is we're controlling against lurking variables. So the idea of control means the overall effect, or the overall effort, excuse me, to minimize variability in the way the units are obtained and treated. Okay? So for example, in my mosquito repellent example, you'd want to make sure that group number one and group number two were as similar as possible, that any lurking variables affected them the same way. So for example, you wouldn't want to have everybody in group number one go first and then group two because actually the mosquitoes might be not as hungry, right? Um, you wouldn't want to have the people in group number two have just been like running outside or have it be a hotter day or a colder day. You want all the lurking variables possible to affect the two groups as equally as possible, okay? Um, in the case of the tomato plant one, you'd want to make every effort to make sure that all the tomato plants were as identical as possible except for the treatments. You want to control against lurking variables. And so it's the idea that if there are lurking variables, which there will be because there's, there's always lurking variables, okay? You want to make sure that the lurking variables affect the groups as evenly as possible. You want to control against lurking variables, okay? Um, so that's the first principle, control. Second principle is something called replication. I referred to this idea uh, a little bit in the past. Replication is the name of the idea that you want to use as many subjects as you can, right? Because if you pick, again, if you pick uh, five Sacred Heart students, they might all have certain kind of, they might be similar in some way. They might all be boys. They might all be seniors. They might all be on the football team. They might all live in Hillsboro, okay? But if your group is as if your groups are as large as possible, okay, then it reduces random variation. It's really unlikely you'd pick if you pick three Americans. It could be that they all live they have something in common. If you pick a thousand Americans, they're going to be better. They're going to do a better job of representing the entire United States. Okay, so replication is the name of the idea that you want your groups to be as large as possible. And we have replication because we want to reduce random variation within the groups. Okay? Third, third principle is the idea of randomization. And this is how do we actually assign the treatments? And the answer is we assign the treatments randomly. So if you think about this, there's actually two different ways we do randomization when we do an experiment. We start with our population and then we pick a sample. Presumably, there's some randomization going on right here in how you pick the sample, because almost always we're going to pick a sample using a simple random sample. Okay? Then, once you have your sample, you split off into, I'm just going to say two groups here. Sorry, group number one and number two. Okay? Well, there's some randomization going on here. right? Once you have your sample, if you say, well, let's have all the males go over here and all the females go over here, then you've you have not done an effective job of controlling because group number one is different than group number two. You want group number one and group number two to be as similar as possible. So we use randomization to assign randomly people from the sample to group one and group two, and that should reduce random variation and make these two groups as similar as possible. Okay? Um, but the idea of randomization is different than what's going on over here and how you pick your sample. Randomization has first to, once you have your sample, how you split the people into groups. Okay? And we'll talk about exactly how to do the randomization a little bit later. Okay, just a couple more vocabulary words before we move on. Um, the first next vocabulary word is something called the placebo effect. And a placebo, if you don't know that term, is essentially a sugar pill. Okay? Placebo is a sugar pill. Or it's basically a treatment, it's a fake treatment, if you will. Because it turns out that it's been very well documented that people actually respond to what they think is a treatment. So, for example, in medicine, if you give people medicine, you say, well, this, this cold medicine, giving people this cold medicine makes colds go away. Well, it turns out it's very well documented. If you just give people a pill that has no active medicine in it and say, hey, this is going to cure your cold, 
there's some percentage of people that just that process of having them think they're taking medicine will make the cold go away. Okay? The name of that idea, the idea that people respond to a fake treatment is called the placebo effect. Okay? So the reason we often use a control group is because we can then distinguish between the placebo effect because anybody who gets better in the control group, it's due to the placebo effect, right? Or anybody who responds to a treatment in the control group is responding to a fake treatment or no treatment at all. That's the placebo effect. And then you can compare the other groups that actually have real treatments to the control group. Um, so the placebo effect is the name of the idea that people respond to a fake treatment. The actual fake treatment is called the placebo. Okay. This next idea is really important. It's the idea of something called statistically significant. And I want to kind of go back to just kind of the, think about the end of the experiment, right? Well, if you had group number one and group number two, and then you'd had A and B, right? Uh, mosquito repellent A, mosquito repellent B. And then the last thing I had wrote measure and compare, right? Well, so let's say, for example, that we had an average number of mosquito bites on the arms of the people in group one, and we had the X bar one was, I don't know, they had 84.3 bites per arm. Yikes, right? And X bar two was 85.1. Now, technically, you might say, gee, mosquito repellent A has fewer bites than mosquito repellent B, but on the other hand, how different are these numbers, right? Boy, they're really, really similar. And groups numbers one and two, you know, they're, why was this, is this difference big enough to be attributed to the actual mosquito repellents? Or was it, different, was it so close that you might say, you know what, this is not really statistically significant? The idea of statistically significant is you're looking for a difference. Let me kind of write this down. It's a difference so large that it is unlikely due to random variation. Okay? This difference of just a few, like less than one mosquito or bite per arm could just happen by random chance because the mosquitoes were flying the way they were flying around, right? But if, for example, uh, mosquito repellents, where am I going here? Oh no, I can't forget how to erase. Let's say this number was actually not this, but it was actually 14.3. Well, now you're thinking, okay, wait a second. There's no way, I shouldn't say there's no way. It's really, really unlikely that just due to random chance, one group would have 14.3 and one group would have 85.1. Now we would say this difference is statistically significant because the numbers are far enough apart. So over here, when you compare, you're not just looking for a difference you are looking for a statistically significant difference. A difference so large that it's unlikely to happen just due to random chance or random variation. Okay, now we're going to talk about our second kind of experimental design, and it's something called a blocked designed experiment. So this is in difference in comparison to the completely or the comparative randomized experiment we already talked about. First, I need to teach you what a block is. A block is a homogeneous, which is a word that just means the same, group of experimental units. So that might be, for example, all males, all females, all freshmen, all sophomores, any group of experimental units or subjects, if they're people, that are all the same in some way. So for example, all trees uh, that grow on the sunny side of campus, right? All of a certain breed of flower, all red roses and all green, you know, yellow roses, something like that. Um, you know, for example, if you did some, you know, perhaps all people who are jog regularly, anything like that where it's a group that are all the same. Um, and in a block designed experiment, you f use blocks. Let me kind of just talk about that on the next page. So this is an example of a block design experiment. You notice it's a little bit more complicated. So the first thing we do is we take a sample. But unlike splitting into groups right away, what we first do is we split into blocks right away. So, right, so these things are blocks. And by that, I mean first you split into all males and all females. So for example, if you started with, let's say, uh, 200 people in your sample, you might first split into blocks of size 100. So 100 males, 100 females. 
then the key thing what you do is within each block, you completely run the entire experiment. Okay? So it's not like all the males get uh, A and all the females get B. Oh no, within each block, you completely run the entire experiment. Okay? And then here, when you get down to here, the purpose is to determine which mosquito repellent works better on the blocks men, because that's what all these came from. Here would be uh, which mosquito repellent works better on women, and then the purpose of this compare would be to compare within blocks. Now, when would you do a block design? Why would you, why would you block? Why block? And the reason would be you would block if you have some reason to believe that the treatments, right, A and B, work differently on different blocks. So in this case, why would you block? Because you have some inkling that mosquito repellents work differently on males than they do on females. If you didn't have that inkling, you wouldn't block because then you wouldn't worry about it. But actually the idea is you want to make, you, this will get you some additional information and also gender might be a lurking variable if you did not block. Okay? So that's kind of the reason for block. You block if you have reason, if you think, if you think that the treatment uh, will affect different blocks, affect blocks, I'm running out of room here, differently. It says differently, but I'm out of room. 